guys and welcome to How to Gastro. In today's video, we'll be talking about quite a well-known disease and that is hepatitis B. So let's get started. So before we get into the specifics of hepatitis B itself, let's do a quick review on what is hepatitis. So hepatitis is the inflammation of the tissue of the liver. The most common causes of the disease is by viral infection. However, this disease can also occur secondary to heavy alcohol intake, certain medications, toxins, other infectious diseases. It can also be caused by an autoimmune process or a non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, which is liver inflammation and damage, which is caused by the buildup of fat in the liver. So what we draw from this quick definition of hepatitis is that hepatitis means the inflammation of the liver. So we have a picture here of a healthy liver and we can see the hepatitis process. You can see this liver is quite inflamed and enlarged. So this is basically what hepatitis means. We also get from this definition that hepatitis can actually be caused by a lot of things. Most commonly it's caused by viral infections, but it can also be caused by certain medications, toxins, an autoimmune process, or a buildup of fat in the liver. So now that we know what hepatitis is and what causes it, let's take a closer look at the types of viruses that cause viral hepatitis. So there are five main types of viral hepatitis. Viral hepatitis is classified into five different types because each of them express different symptoms and require different forms of treatment. So there are five main types of viral hepatitis. They are hepatitis virus type A, type B, type C, type D, and type E. So in today's video, we're just gonna focus on hepatitis virus type B. I did do a video on the type A and I will be going through C, D, and E shortly. So if you guys want to check out A, you can give that video a watch. I'll put a link for it in the description. So what is hepatitis B? Hepatitis B is a serious liver infection that is caused by the hepatitis B virus, which is also commonly known as HBV. The virus can cause both acute and chronic infections, which means it can cause an acute hepatitis or chronic hepatitis. The disease is said to be acute if it lasts less than six months, and chronic if it lasts more than six months. Having chronic hepatitis B can be very serious as it may lead to the development of liver failure, liver cancer, or liver cirrhosis, which is a condition that permanently scars the liver. So in this little picture below, I put in the different stages of the hepatitis. So we have acute hepatitis if the infection lasts less than six months. And usually these patients don't experience serious complications of the virus because their body is able to fight back and destroy the virus. But if the virus is able to remain active for six months in the body or more, it is said to have become a chronic infection. And this is where symptoms become a lot more serious. So from chronic hepatitis, we can go to liver cirrhosis, and that is basically the fibrosis of the liver. So the liver becomes very fibrotic. And of course, over these stages, the functioning ability of the liver is lost severely. And finally, it can lead to liver cancer, which is a hepatocellular carcinoma, that is HCC. And this usually occurs in patients who have a high HBV DNA level. So the hepatitis B virus is a DNA virus, and we can measure the patient's blood levels to check for the level of the HBV DNA in their blood. And this is used sort of as a prognostic factor. So moving on, let's talk about the causes. So what are the causes of hepatitis B virus? The main ways of transmission include sexual contact, which means having unprotected sex with someone who is infected because the virus passes via blood, saliva, semen, or vaginal secretions that enter the body. We can also have parenteral transmission, and the hepatitis B virus easily spreads through needles and syringes contaminated with the infected blood, and this is why it's such a major concern in healthcare centers as well as tattoo parlors because the virus is actually able to spread very easily through infected needles. We can also have horizontal transmission and in this case the hepatitis virus is said to be spread by lesions of impetigo or scabies. So these are dermatological conditions in which the viral particles can actually spread and infect another person in this way. And of course we have the perinatal transmission in which the pregnant mom infected with HPV can pass the virus to their baby during childbirth. So in this picture on my right we just have the different ways in which the hepatitis B virus can be transmitted. We have blood and lymph, tattoos, 
body piercings, healthcare workers, sharing toothbrushes or razors because we often bleed from our gums when we brush our teeth as well as we bleed from the areas we shave with our razor and all those blood and viral particles enter the toothbrushes and razors and are able to infect another person who may use the item. We have sexual activity transmission and that is in homosexual as well as heterosexual couples and we can have the mother to newborn. So now let's talk about some signs and symptoms of hepatitis B. The signs and symptoms usually appear about one to four months after one has been infected, although one may experience them as early as two weeks post-infection. The symptoms include sudden nausea and vomiting, abdominal pain or discomfort, especially on the upper right side beneath the lower ribs, and that is where the liver is located in the body. The patient may experience clay-colored bowel stools and dark urine. So the color of the patient's stool is usually a lot lighter and the urine becomes a lot darker. The patient may also experience loss of appetite and fatigue, low-grade fever and joint pain, a yellowing of the skin and the whites of the eyes, which is called jaundice, intense itching, and encephalopathy. So now that we know what the signs and symptoms are, let's talk about the diagnosis of hepatitis B. Laboratory evaluation of hepatitis B disease generally consists of liver enzyme tests. These include the levels of alanine aminotransferase, which is also known as ALT, aspartate aminotransferase, which is AST, alkaline phosphatase, which is ALP, gamma glutamyl transpeptidase, which is GGT, as well as the liver function tests that include the total and direct serum bilirubin, albumin levels, and the international normalized ratio. So a few months ago, I did a video on the liver function test where I go into a more detailed description of all these enzymes. So if you want to check that video out on the liver function testing, you can give that a watch because it's really important to understand why these enzymes are so helpful in detecting liver disease. So when we talk about damage to the liver cells or the hepatocytes, we talk about increased levels of the ALT, AST, ALP, and GGT. So these levels actually increase because the liver is sending out sort of a distress signal to tell the body that something is wrong there. The total bilirubin levels will also increase and this is why the patients usually present with the yellowing of the skin which is called jaundice and very itchy skin because the bilirubin deposits actually collect at the level of the skin and this causes the patient to be very itchy. So the albumin levels will decrease and that is because the liver is actually involved in the production of proteins such as albumin. So if there's a problem at the liver and it's unable to carry out its specific functions, it's not going to be able to create the albumin as it normally would. So the INR is a test that measures the blood's ability to clot. And when we have a high INR, it means that our blood is not clotting very well, which means it's a lot thinner. So the INR is helpful in the liver function test because the liver actually produces certain proteins that usually help the blood clot normally. And when we have a high INR, it means that the liver function is not that good, which means there's some sort of a liver failure, essentially. And that is why the INR will be increased because our blood is not able to clot as it normally would. So after we measure the liver enzymes as well as test the functioning of the liver with the bilirubin levels, albumin levels and the INR, we need to check for specific antigens and antibodies against the hepatitis B virus. So let's look at what that includes. So to diagnose the hepatitis B, we can use the serology test to test for specific antigens or antibodies. So first we'll talk about the antigens. Serological test for hepatitis B surface antigen, which is commonly known as HBSAG, and hepatitis B core antibody, which is anti-HBC immunoglobulin M, are required for the diagnosis of acute hepatitis B. So the hepatitis B surface antigen is positive in both acute and chronic hepatitis B infections. However, the presence of IgM anti-HBC is diagnostic for acute or recently acquired infection. So from the antigens, there's two main ones. We have the HBSAG, which is the hepatitis B surface antigen, and we also have the IgM. And the IgM is the IgM anti-HBC, which is anti-hepatitis B core. 
So if you look at this graph on my right, you see that in this beautiful blue line, we have the HBSAG, which is the hepatitis B surface antigen, which peaks after the initial infection. And you can see here, it peaks quite early. This is the months after exposure. So on our x-axis, we have the months after exposure. And you can see one, two months, three months, etc. And we see that the HBSAG, which is the surface antigen, peaks quite early. And that can be used to diagnose the presence of a acute or chronic infection. But something that's not on this graph is the IgM anti-HBC. And that usually peaks somewhere close to this light blue line. And the IgM antibodies actually tell us that we have an acute infection only. So now let's talk about the antibodies. We have antibodies to HBS AG, which is the antibody against the hepatitis B surface antigen. And that is produced after a resolved infection and is the only HPV antibody marker that is present after a vaccination. So all those who have been vaccinated for the hepatitis B virus will have the antibody HPS AG present. So if you look at my graph on the right, you see this dark, dark blue line. That is the anti-HPS, which is basically the antibody against the hepatitis B surface antigen. The presence of HBSAG, which is what we just spoke about, and the total anti-HBC, and anti-HBC is the antibody against the hepatitis B core antigen. So the hepatitis B virus has all these surface antigens, core antigens, etc. So this is actually antibodies against the hepatitis B core antigen that we're speaking about. And if the patient has a negative test for the IgM, anti-HBC, this indicates a chronic HPV infection and the absence of IgM, anti-HBC or the persistence of HB SAG for six months indicates a chronic infection. So basically all we need to know from there is the IgM antibodies for hepatitis B virus needs to be low or absent as well as a high titer of the anti-HBC and anti-HBS. So these two you can see they peak after six months. So as long as these two are present, we know that we have a chronic infection after six months. The presence of anti-HBC alone, which is this here, might indicate an acute resolved or chronic infection or a false positive result. So continuing with more procedures in the diagnostic process, we can also use imaging or staging studies. And in this category, we have the abdominal ultrasound as well as the vibration control transient elastography which is the fibro scan or fibro max and that actually looks at the mechanical structure of the liver and can see what stage the patient is in terms of the hepatitis liver cirrhosis or the development of the hepatocellular carcinoma so finally let's talk about the treatment of hepatitis b so if someone has been known to be exposed to the hepatitis b virus and they aren't sure if they've been vaccinated one should get a shot of the hepatitis B immunoglobulin, which is the HBIG, and the first three shots of the hepatitis B vaccine to prevent the full onset of the disease. So if you got a recent tattoo or you had a recent sexual encounter with someone who may be infected with the hepatitis B virus, you should get your shots immediately. So in acute infection, the treatment with antiviral medicine usually isn't needed. Home treatments such as eating well, drinking plenty of fluids, and avoiding alcohol and drugs usually will relieve symptoms. So alcohol and certain medications are avoided because they can cause liver toxicity. So if the liver is in a bit of stress, we don't want to stress the liver out anymore. So this is why we avoid these substances. Treatment for chronic hepatitis B may be required for the rest of patient's life and include antiviral medications such as intacovir, tenofovir, lamivudine, adafovir, and talbivudine. These medications can help fight the virus and slow the ability to damage the liver. So we can also do interferon injections, and interferon alpha-2b is a man-made version of a substance produced by the body to fight infection. And we can also do a liver transplant if the liver has been severely damaged by virus invasion so before we end this video, I just want to say a few words about the vaccination for hepatitis B. The hepatitis B vaccine is a vaccine that prevents the development of the disease hepatitis B. Because this virus is generally spread from person to person and is quite easy to catch, vaccination comes highly recommended. 
especially among healthcare workers who are at the highest risk for contracting the disease. It is estimated that about 780,000 people die each year due to consequences of hepatitis B, such as liver cirrhosis and liver cancer. So protection from the vaccine lasts at least 20 years and is said to possibly be lifelong. And therefore, I recommend it because it's always better to be safe than sorry. And that brings us to the end of this video on hepatitis B. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please make sure to like, comment, subscribe and share. Hope you found the presentation very interesting and informative. If you'd like to download a copy of the presentation, you may do so by clicking the link in the description. Take care and bye for now.